first of all, a very, very warm welcome as well from me. It is amazing to see so many familiar faces, but as well, so many new faces to welcome to our Frontiers community. Huge, huge welcome. And we are all here indeed, because we are united by our common mission to make all of science open so that we can accelerate the solutions that will enable healthy lives on a healthy planet. And nothing demonstrates this accelerator effect of opening up our science as the recent COVID pandemic. So I'm going to take you down onto memory lane three years, uh, January 2020, when most of us were still not aware that there was a pandemic luring around the corner. But Chinese scientists had already sequenced uh, this novel coronavirus and posted this genetic code openly accessible onto public servers. And this immediately triggered the race for a COVID vaccine. This book, which I got from a nice friend, thank you, Stefan, this book describes the vaccine race from the perspective of the two BioNTech co-founders. Uh, Drs. Özlem Turetsky and Ugur Sahin. Within just the course of one weekend in January, they had read the paper, they had looked up this openly accessible genetic code on the public servers, they had designed eight different vaccine candidates. So this is from Friday till Saturday. Okay, what do we do on a weekend uh, normally? <laughs> And they had prepared their teams already for production and discussions for Monday morning. They started racing. Now, of course, these two are very exceptional and we have a lot to be grateful for to BioNTech. But the moment that the code hit the public servers, this race also started at AstraZeneca, at Moderna, and at countless research labs across the world. The race for the vaccine was on. Now let's fast forward three months. We're in March 2020. There's not a soul to be seen out there on the streets. We now sit in lockdown. Remember, it's a new word. I learned a new word, lockdown. And in fact, we are fearing potentially for the lives of our parents and grandparents. So in this situation, everybody's turning towards scientists. And it becomes blatantly obvious that if we want to accelerate these scientists to deliver treatments, to deliver vaccines, we have to give them access to all of the science. And that is why on March 16th, the White House and the coalition of research organizations opened up the COVID-19 open research data set and putting together all coronavirus related research articles into one database and making it openly accessible to both people, anybody, as well as machines. And this immediately accelerated the knowledge creation. We had about 30,000 research articles um, out there. Today, it's well over one million. It was the fastest knowledge creation in human history. And by making all of this openly accessible, humanity delivered vaccines and treatments at a pace never, ever seen before in human history. It was by far the fastest ever. But of course, what has been achieved for COVID has not yet been achieved for other respiratory diseases. They still kill 7 million people every single year. Cancer kills 10 million people. Cardiovascular diseases, 18 million people a year. And just a fraction of the science is made openly accessible. Do we not want to save these lives as well? Do we not want to accelerate treatments here as well? And of course, then there is the climate emergency, the biggest challenge of our generation. And here as well, just a fraction of the science is made openly accessible. But this is the biggest emergency that we're facing today. Within just 
27 years, we have to transition from fossil-fueled economies towards net-zero, carbon-free, clean economies. We're on a deadline here. The clock is ticking. 27 years only to transition. COVID has shown us that we can produce solutions very quickly if everything falls in place from governments to businesses, the researchers, and all the science is openly accessible. And that is why we now have to transition from a publishing system that is behind paywalls towards a publishing system that is, by default, entirely openly accessible, where the science can just flow freely around the world. Because open science is the simplest way on how to accelerate scientific solutions, and it is the only way of how to accelerate scientific solutions to the net zero clean economy on these pressing deadlines that we have. It's also the simplest and the most cost-effective way today to save lives. And that is something that funders and policymakers across the entire world have recognized. Mandates have been increasing year after year. Most recently, last summer, the White House ordered that all federally funded research needs to be made openly accessible by 2026. And this is a mandate that is being fought. It's not a given. Don't take it for granted. There's right now a petition going through Congress to stop this. But President Biden lost a son to cancer, so this is an issue as well dear to his heart. He said the following. The taxpayers fund five billion in cancer research every year, but once it's published, nearly all of that taxpayer-funded research sits behind walls. Tell me how this is moving along the process more rapidly. It is not. Let's hear it from himself. When I led the cancer moonshot as vice president, one of the biggest issues I talked about was how federally funded cancer researchers were not sharing their results with their peers or the public because they wanted to have the answer. You all know it. As I mentioned earlier, we made federally funded cancer research more available to any patient, to any doctor, anywhere for free. And today, as president, we're making sure that transparency applies to all federally funded science beyond just cancer. And we have supported this mandate as we have supported many other mandates from the European Commission and as well the Plan S, which was a coalition of 29 international funders as well mandating open accessibility to their research. And we have Robert Jan Smits, the brain, the leader behind this initiative as well with us and he'll be saying a few words tonight. Now, for this transition to happen, to really transition from a closed publishing system towards an open publishing system and a research ecosystem that is by default open, all the players need to play along. They need to act and they need to deliver. The traditional subscription publishers need to flip their business models towards open access. But of course, this will not happen just on its own, not because they may not want it, but because all of their revenue is locked up within that subscription business model. So they will need a little bit of nudging. The mandates from the funders, from the policy makers, they need to come up with strict deadlines and just make it happen. They also need to provide the funds for this transition to happen, because it does cost in addition. University leaders as well need to uh, participate in these mandates and also need to make the funds available. Very often we hear from libraries at universities that they would love to pay for the open access articles, but that all of their budgets are already locked up in, the, in paying for subscriptions. This needs to change, and Fred will tell you a bit more about this. 
We as a community, as scientists, need to participate as well. I'm a scientist, so many scientists sitting in here in this room. We are participating by advocating, by voting with our feet, publishing open access, depositing our data. That's the right thing to do. And finally, the open access publishers as well have their part to play. They have to show that it is possible to transition towards full open access at the highest quality. Every industry needs these bright examples. In the transition to the net zero economies, we need solar panel companies. We need the electric car companies to show that it is possible to transition. And this is really what we see here as well as in Frontiers, is our responsibility. Drive this transition towards full open access across all of academia. Now, when Henry and I, uh, we started Frontiers about 17 years ago, uh, this picture shows us, maybe not in better days, but in younger days, uh, at least, for sure. At the Society for Neuroscience meeting in San Diego in 2007, we're both neuroscientists, so we started around uh, neuroscience. And when we launched the first journals, specialties, and sections, we really did it together with colleagues and friends whom we trusted. You see them as well here. Idan is sitting um, over there. Axel Clermans is sitting over here. So the dinosaurs of Frontiers, they were there pretty much from the beginning. They put their trust in us. And we have a big responsibility uh, when, so, when the communities are so closely knit. A lot of responsibility lies on your shoulders. Trust can never be lost because everything is built on personal relationships. Today, we are well beyond just the neuroscience community, as you well know, but the principles remain the same. Every journal, every section is built on the trust and on the integrity of the people participating. And indeed, we have now built close to 200 uh, communities around 1,500 different academic disciplines. Those are 1,500 different scientific communities. And they are very closely aligned now with the Sustainable Development Goals because we want to accelerate those solutions that will enable healthy lives on a healthy planet. We have indeed come a very long uh, way. As Fred said yesterday night, the last time we stood here, we were the 16th largest publisher. Today, Frontiers is already the sixth largest publisher in the world, with a plan in place on how to continue to drive this transition towards full open access. And we have grown over the years. Here you see submission, acceptance, and rejection numbers over the years. Last year, in fact, was a very important milestone year for us. For the very first time, we reached over 100,000 publications, but as well over 100,000 rejections. We celebrated, but it was as well a challenge. Why? Because by far the biggest exponential growth rate that we see right now is in the rejections. Back in the day when the journals were still rather small and had uh, no, no impact factors, it was these closely knit communities that were publishing in the journals and submitting to them, setting an example. Rejection rates were relatively small. Today, the journals are successful, they are impactful, and they are attracting authors from literally all over the world. And some are not meeting the quality thresholds for peer review. This is causing a lot of work. It's causing a lot of work internally for our teams because we're employing hundreds of people, as you will hear from Dimitri, hundreds of people that are supporting the peer review process but it's also causing a lot of work for you, the editorial boards, because you have to occasionally deal with these papers. And Dimitri will tell you more about how we are ramping up our desk review process to help you sort this out. One way of as well how to uh, cope with this increase in submissions was 
to hire many more people. These are the front ones. Uh, in fact, we doubled up last year. We are now well over 2,400 front ons, as we call ourselves the Frontiers employees. There is uh, 1,400 of us supporting the journals, hundreds in the peer review, supporting the peer review process as well. We're spread over 17 different countries. We also employ hundreds of people in technology because every step of the process is underpinned by technology to maximize quality control. And Daniel will tell you more about how we go about technology here. Now, you may be thinking, what have I gotten myself into? This place is really growing so much. It's a rocket ship. Am I really sitting tightly in my seat or do I want to get out? <laughs> What I want to tell you now is that Frontiers today is still a rather small fish in a very, very big pond. So these are the articles published last year uh, as, as measured in the web of science, about 3 million articles. In gray, we see subscription. In gold or yellow, we see open access. And in blue, you see Frontiers. Frontiers share in these 3 million articles published last year is about 4%. We see this across the different academic disciplines and in the clinical sciences where we started, the share is a little bit bigger and that's as well the discipline with the highest amount of open access articles. I would like to hope that we all made a contribution in driving open access in the clinical and in the life sciences. I won't go into much detail here, but suffice to say, open access is not yet the default or the new normal uh, state across all of these different academic disciplines. And Frontiers share is still rather small. There is still a lot of work to be done to make this transition towards full open accessibility across all of academia a reality. And of course, this can only happen with trust and with integrity. And that's why we're committing ourselves to these values that really unite us all. What does it mean when we say we place the researcher at the center of everything that we do? It means that we really listen, as through the course of this uh, week, in direct conversations. But it also means that we uh, survey thousands and thousands of people systematically, as you can see here. And the vast majority of our authors, the reviewers, the editors and topic editors rate their experience with Frontiers as either good or excellent, which you see in the blue proportion of the bars. Of course, out there, uh, the least satisfied are the rejected authors, which is not very surprising, I would say. But we also see a small slither of red going through the other categories. Now, I won't lie to you. Even though that is a small proportion, this feedback can be occasionally brutal. You will get it into your, into your inboxes. You will see it on social media. Authors will say, this costs too much. It's just too expensive. And Fred will put this into perspective. Is it really costing more than subscription? No, it's not. But he will also explain to you how we go about it with universities and with funders to resolve this concern for researchers. Sometimes reviewers or editors will say, well, I work for free. I want to be recognized. And maybe it's not enough to just recognize researchers on the editorial boards as we do, or on the paper in itself, which was a form of acknowledgement. Fred, once again, will tell you how we work together with the research community, with many of you sitting in this room, on building a recognition program that really works for you. Sometimes people will say, editors or reviewers, well, you invited me to the wrong articles. This does not match my expertise. So this is, again, a concern that Daniel will address in his presentation on how we're improving, once again, with you, 
uh, the matching algorithms to really be able to invite the right reviewers and the right editors for the right article. Sometimes people will simply say, this article does not meet the quality standards. Why did you put it into peer review? You should have desk rejected it. And that is a concern that Dimitri will address in his uh, 15 minutes, uh, how we ramped up the desk review process in particular last year. And then finally, there is the concern uh, not related to a particular uh, editor, or, but a concern really a murmur out there in the community. You simply cannot build high quality journals that are growing so fast and publishing at these large volumes. It's what we constantly hear. And it's true. This is a hard problem to solve. It's not easy to do this. And some, maybe a few, will get it wrong. But we do try to get it right, together with you, together with the community, and this is something that Miriam will be addressing in her presentation. We value collaboration, receiving your feedback, working with you, and building these communities. We value innovation, because let's be clear, without technology, it is not possible to publish large volumes at scale and at the highest quality. Of course, we value speed because we are on an urgent mission to make all of science open. And we also have a responsibility towards our authors. They want to get out there fast. But nothing trumps quality. Everything that we do here is underpinned by quality. Because science is the motor of modern society. Without trust in science, society cannot take the right decisions. And without trust in the publisher, the publisher simply has no future. That's why quality here is not an accident. It is something that we actually highly engineer. And it, in fact, it starts with you sitting in this room and out there in the virtual space. We take great care in whom we appoint to our editorial boards. Because you, as the editorial community, set the quality standards for the peer review, but you're also submitting to your journal. So you're setting the quality standards for the type of articles that we want to publish. And that's why we try to recruit the best researchers from all the top universities, from Harvard, Oxford, Max Planck, you have them all. And quality is as well something that is measurable. Sometimes people say, you can't measure quality, you have to read the paper. Yes, it's true, you have to. But you can also simply ask people, now what do you think about the quality? The quality of the article, the editorial board, or the peer review? And over 90% of more than 20,000 visitors to the platform rate the quality of the articles of the peer review and the editorial boards as good or excellent. And finally, impact and quality can as well be measured through citation metrics. So here we uh, display the average citation rate um, to articles published in the last three recent years. And we display all the different largest publishers sorted by their average citation rate. Frontiers today is the third most cited publisher out there. And in fact, if we look only at multidisciplinary publishers, it is the number one most cited publisher is something you can be proud of, because this is your accomplishment, the work that you have put into it. And again, this is not an accident. We have been in this position for the last couple of years. It's the result of all the quality controls that we're trying to put in place. Now, while this can make you proud, I hope that the next data representation will give you hope and make you happy. At least it makes me happy, because you can literally see that the world is hungry for science. 
Frontier's articles have received over 2 billion views and downloads, and this is growing exponentially every single year. There is literally an innovator in every single corner of this world. And these are the people that we want to accelerate. What I tried to convey to you is that you are part of a mission-driven organization. We are determined to make open access the new normal across all academic fields. Because we believe that this is the most effective way on how to accelerate scientific solutions to enable healthy lives on a healthy planet. And in this mission, every single one counts. As I said, this is not a simple mission, not an easy thing to accomplish. It's a hard problem. It requires people who are smart. It requires people who are dedicated. It requires people who persevere and have grit. But above all, it requires people who work well together as a community. And I think, or I believe, this is something that we have accomplished together. So with that, I would like to thank you for your dedication, for your grit, for your perseverance, for your passion in working together, making science open. Thank you very much. Thank you.